Hello. Today we're going to be talking about chapters 23 and 24. And for my specific course, I am going to be pulling out some of the specific disease processes that we're going to be covering. These two chapters are actually very um, extensive. And if you're taking another course or if you are interested in learning more about our babies at risk and our babies with special needs, you will want to spend more time in the textbook uh, looking at those disease processes. So when we are talking about fetal growth, there are lots of things that will actually affect fetal growth. And we've covered several of these um, in our lectures previously. I'm going to just um, make sure this is always visible. Okay, so um, maternal nutrition. If our mom is not getting adequate nutrition or some of those disease processes like a gestational uh, uh, um, hyperemesis could definitely affect it. Genetics also affect fetal growth. Some um, of us are uh, grow big babies and some of us grow smaller babies. How well the placenta is functioning if we have maybe a marginal insertion or if we have um, a potential for um, abruption or a placental previa, placenta accreta, any of those could affect our function as well. And then environmental factors. Um, these will also affect how we are um, uh, growing those babies. So when we're looking at birth weight variations, we have a couple of different um, terms that we use. We have appropriate for gestational age or AGA, which um, has some specific um, uh, determining factors that put us into that. That's one of the reasons that we're doing some measurements when the baby is born. We have small for gestational age, uh, under 2,500 grams at birth or below um, the 10th percentile on that graph. And then we have large for gestational age, which is in the 90th percentile or over 4,000 grams, which is eight pounds, 13 ounces at term. So we, when we are looking at this baby down here, you can see that we have, um, I want to make sure this is still staying visible, perfect. This baby has that classic frog-like posture. You can see this is a preterm, premature infant, and um, this is a, a very classic posture that gives us a very um, early clue that maybe this baby isn't as um, far along in the gestational period that we had thought. Here are two babies. This one is uh, obviously a large for gestational age, and here we have a small for gestational age, and you can see uh, these babies actually are the same gestational age. I believe they are, and they um, ha have very different looks to them. So when we're looking at birth weight, we also have our low birth weight infants, which is under 2,500 grams, our very low birth weight infants, which is under 1,500 grams, and extremely low birth weight infants, which is under 1,000 grams. And each of these babies have their own unique needs um, when we are caring for them. So here are some examples of some different sized infants, newborns. So our small for gestational age babies, um, we see sometimes they have a higher risk of perinatal asphyxia, meaning they're not getting um, the oxygen needs that they uh, needed during delivery. They have difficulty maintaining their temperatures because they don't have the same uh, lay down of fat underneath the skin as our uh, larger babies or our um, older babies. We have issues with hypoglycemia, issues with polycythemia, which can increase our chance of um, uh, hyperbilirubinemia, and meconium aspiration is at higher risk, and birth trauma. Because these babies are more fragile, they have um, the possibility of, of uh, experiencing uh, higher rates of birth trauma, depending on their delivery route. And you might want to take a look at the table 23.1 in your textbook to look at some of those um, issues that can happen. So some of the risk factors that are associated with large for gestational babies, maternal diabetes or glucose intolerance. Um, um, we have a history of a macrosomic infant, post-dates gestation, maternal obesity, being male, they typically are larger, and sometimes it's just genetics. 
multi-parity, meaning they've had m more than one pregnancy before. So women typically have their smaller babies in as their first baby, and then they grow larger babies um, with subsequent pregnancies. So some of our large for gestational age characteristics, we have that full plump face. They are proportionately increased in body size. Sometimes they have poor motor skills because they're so large they can't control their muscular activity. And they have difficulty regulating their behavioral states. Some of these really large for gestational babies have a, a poor feeding ability and um, uh, ha, ha, end up in the NICU having to ha have assistance being fed. So uh, the other thing that happens with these large for gestational age babies is this chest diameter is much larger. And when we have a larger chest diameter, it's harder for these babies to turn and do those cardinal movements of birth and fit down through that pelvis. So we have higher risk of having um, other conditions. We'll talk more about those in just a minute. This is a very large for gestational age baby. Um, this baby was uh, born to uh, the mother that had gestational diabetes and it was not very well controlled. And this, uh, whenever we see a large for gestational age baby, we are concerned that maybe we missed the diabetes or it wasn't as well controlled as we had hoped. And we are going to be looking at um, cardiac defects and hypoglycemia. The issue with our baby, as we've discussed in previous videos, is when you have all that blood sugar being shunted to that baby prenatally, and then suddenly that uh, the, the baby is um, producing insulin in, in relationship to that high blood sugar. And when that cord is cut and the large amounts of high blood sugar are no longer there, the baby's pancreas continues to produce that insulin and we see, we experience hypoglycemia, sometimes very detrimental hypoglycemia. So we have to watch these babies very closely. Other issues that we might have, as I already mentioned, birth trauma is one of the, one, one of the things we are concerned about, shoulder dystocia specifically, um, hypoglycemia, polycythemia, and hyperbilirubinemia. Again, all of these are issues that are our uh, average gestational age babies can have, but we see it in much great, in, in higher quantities in these other high risk uh, babies. When we're talking about term, preterm, late preterm, and post term, here are the weeks. Um, anything term, you're going to see this vary between 37 and 38 weeks, but typically we consider um, anything above 37 weeks term. We would never induce uh, a mom for a non-medical reason before the 39th week. That was an initiative that happened in the last couple of years. And we have definitely seen a decrease in our um, comorbidities with those babies. So um, induction does not happen before the 39th week unless there's a medical indication, a true medical documented uh, indication. Our preterm is before 37 weeks. In between that 34 and 36 weeks, we call those our late pretermers. Sometimes those babies, um, the 35, 36 weekers, will be out with their parents and not in um, the nursery, in the NICU. But they have a different needs than the babies that um, are, are term. We, they have a harder time maintaining their temperature. They don't feed as well. They're very sleepy. So we have to watch them a little bit closer. And then we have our post-term babies, which are considered after 42 weeks. But again, you very rarely see that because most um, providers are uh, inducing before that 42nd week. Our post-term newborn has um, some issues. Sometimes we worry about the placenta. Uh, being able to provide the nutrients that they need after 42 weeks. We do sh see a sharp increase in um, neonatal or uh, perinatal death in our babies that are post 42 weeks gestation. That's why they push so hard to have those babies um, induced and born. You will see dry, cracked, wrinkled skin, sometimes meconium stained. That's not unusual. They sometimes will have long nails, they'll have creases over their entire feet. They may have abundant hair, that umbilical cord has gotten thin. There may be calcifications on that placenta. There may be limited vernix um, on them. And all of these are signs that this baby was post mature. The issue we worry about is that the placenta is not providing the nutrients that the baby needs. And so some of the testing that we do for that are NST, and our biophysical profile are very important. If a mom 
um, feels very strongly about not being induced and she has a provider that is willing, they can continue doing adequate testing, which is every three days with good education to the mother um, about uh, fetal kick counts and paying attention to fetal movement. And they can do that every three days um, to make sure that that baby is still um, getting the, what they need from that placenta. So here are some signs. This is a very peely baby. You can see that's kind of a meconium staining going on. And here is um, some of that peeling. Lotion's going to help. This is going to heal up on its own. It's just uh, because that vernix has gone away and is no longer protecting them from being in the water. Post-term problems, again, perinatal asphyxia, uh, greater increase, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, meconium aspiration, polycythemia. It's interesting. Uh, all these same problems that we see with our preterm babies, we can also see with our postterm babies. And then some of the things that lead up to preterm birth. We don't exactly know what causes it, but infection and inflammation is a very large suspicion. And we hope that moms have um, good, adequate dental care before they get pregnant. We, there is some link to some dental caries and infection in um, that area that can lead to preterm uh, delivery or preterm birth and, um, and labor. Sometimes it's maternal or fetal distress. We see moms that come in with preeclampsia that go into labor because their body knows the cure to this, the fix is to get that placenta off the wall. And so they will come into labor on their own. Bleeding or any of those bleeding issues that we've discussed in other lectures and um, stretching. So as we have more than one baby in the uterus, as that uterus gets to capacity and is full, sometimes we will see, it's quite often we will see multiples are born early. Some of the preterm characteristics, they have poor muscle tone, they don't have that fat as I talked about before. If they're extremely preterm, they may have fused eyelids, that's extremely preterm. Their skin is very thin, transparent. They have absence to few creases in their soles. And that's one of the things that we um, look for when we are trying to determine that gestational age. We can perform a Ballard assessment, which will give us a good idea within, with accuracy of about two weeks around that gestational period, how far along this baby is, what gestational age we are at. And we were also going to see abundant vernix. That abundant vernix is um, telling us, remember that's inversely related to the amount of surfactant that is in their lungs. So if you have a ton of vernix, we are concerned that we may, maybe don't have that surfactant, so we're going to be watching that respiratory um, issues very closely. These are some pictures of our babies. This is a baby in an isolate. We have our monitors on. Um, this is the um, temp probe that is going to make sure that isolate is keeping that baby at the optimal temperatures. We are watching cardiac rhythm, respiratory rate, O2 sat. This baby has IVs. This baby is actually on um, some respiratory support and is in an isolate that looks like this. And you'll see these covered up, which is concerning to people that are not used to being um, around NICU babies. But remember, these babies are on continuous monitoring. So we know what's going on with them at all times. We also will see these um, babies uh, laying on their tummies and using certain positional aids. We would never recommend that for a term baby that's going home, but in the NICU, because their heads are so fragile, their bodies are so fragile, we have to be very careful to not uh, allow their heads to become disproportionately shaped because of how we're positioning them in the NICU. So this isolate is meant to keep them, it's, it's like a womb, and it's meant to keep them in a quiet, darkened environment so that they can rest, grow, and heal. We never want to tap on the glass. We try to cluster all of our care to let these babies still have some human interaction, but not overstimulate them. Their neurological systems are not ready for us to uh, uh, interact with them in the way that we would interact with the term newborn. So a lot of this education needs to be done when our parents uh, first come in to visit their babies. Here's another little guy, um, oxygen saturation around the foot. You can see also has, looks to have some uh, high flow nasal cannula on there. We're getting feeding through an oral gastric or a nasal gastric tube. These little guys can't, don't have the energy to take in the amount of calories that they need for growth. Uh, they use up all of their energy. So 
we regulate that very closely to make sure that they're getting the amount of calories they need for growth and not using it all up trying to uh, nipple feed. So some of the preterm problems, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and problems related to the immaturity of that immune system. Remember, we have discussed in previous lectures that the fetus gets a lot of the, that immunity towards the end of the pregnancy. And so if this baby does not get that Ig, IgM through the placenta from the mom, uh, we're going to see even uh, uh, more repressed immune system. So our premature babies are, are very fragile. Some of the things that we're going to help them do when they're in the NI and this baby's being fed through a nasogastric tube is oxygenation. Sometimes we have to help them with that oxygenation. In the beginning, their oxygen, oxygen levels don't have to be as high as we would expect a full-term baby to be. In fact, 88 to 94 is about where they kind of hang out and where we want to support them at. And then as their gestational age increases, those numbers will increase. We're going to be helping them with their temperature. That's why they're in those isolates that are temperature controlled. Sometimes they even add some moisture to help with their uh, skin. We're going to be controlling their nutrition and their fluid balance. And, and most likely they will be on some sort of IV support as well as uh, uh, feeding support. And this will help them as they uh, continue their growth and will help with their electrolyte imbalance and those labs are watched very closely. So the other thing that we will have to do with these guys is infection prevention. So most of the time you will um, have antibiotics, uh, especially in the beginning, because if there was infection that caused the preterm delivery to happen in the first place, we're going to be uh, helping those little ones get over a lot. Um, several of the medications that we use, well, one and specifically is autotoxic. So our babies have to be watched very closely with their hearing screens. And if they receive antibiotics that are autotoxic, gentamicin being the one I am speaking of now, they will have to have a repeat hearing screen after we have um, given that medication. I already discussed the decreased stimulation. We might have to help them with pain management, especially if they are um, having issues withdrawing from a substance that mom was using during pregnancy that now the baby is addicted to. We're going to be encouraging their growth and development. I discussed the positional aids that are utilized. And then parental support. These are um, parents that feel very inadequate to care for their children because they need such high levels of care. This is beyond what most parents uh, have in their toolbox. And so as nurses, our role is not to do it for them, but to help them do it. When anytime they are available to come in and provide the diaper changing and temperature taking and feeding of this baby and holding of this baby, we very much encourage that because they are after all still this baby's parent and we're just taking care of the medical aspect of it. Discharge preparation looks very different for a NICU baby and it's usually a several day process to get them ready, to, especially depending on the type of support they're going to need once they are um, uh, at home, so if they need respiratory support, if they need ongoing uh, care from a, a high-risk clinic, so these are types of things that we need to determine before they are, before they leave us in our care. So again, that late, that preterm newborn versus that late preterm newborn, uh, there are challenges, and we need to be paying very close attention. That that late preterm newborn is going to need a little more time with us to make sure that they are able to fly independently before we send them home with their parents. These are, that's that 35 to 37 week. We definitely have some feeding challenges there. We wanna make sure they have good follow-up, that they have a medical home that they can follow up with and that um, they have good resources to assist with feeding if need be. Now we're gonna move into the newborn at risk uh, in chapter 24, and we're gonna spend most of our time talking about acquired disorders versus congenital disorders. 
you will spend some more time talking about the congenital disorders when you study pediatrics. So I'm gonna mainly focus on the acquired disorders. So basically the difference between the two are acquired typically occurs at or soon after birth and congenital are present. They're usually due to some type of malformation, something that happened with inheritance. Sometimes there's a complex etiology. Sometimes you can see um, uh, different uh, infections that can cause some congenital disorders but typically we would think of infection as an acquired disorder. Um, these are problems or conditions experienced by the woman during her pregnancy or at birth. Some of the acquired disorders that we see, we've talked about neonatal asphyxia. So what you can think of that is our baby did not have the um, uh, oxygen that they needed in that perinatal time when they were getting ready to be born and uh, then they had a lactic acid buildup and that can cause damage to the brain. So neonatal asphyxia, and, or, or the baby doesn't breathe right after delivery and uh, we don't help that baby soon enough. Transient tachypnea of the newborn, that's that fast breathing. We see this very frequently in our C-section babies and in our late preterm babies. The, the C-section babies specifically don't get that squeeze through the vagina, so they, have all this excess fluid that they now need to breathe out. And so we see some transient tachypnea and it can become worrisome if that baby gets tired and suddenly goes into respiratory distress or um, respiratory arrest. And so respiratory distress syndrome is what transient tachypnea can turn into. If respiratory distress syndrome is not treated, they can become very tired. It can move into other conditions like bronchopulmonary dysplasia and, um, can end up being a chronic condition. We, meconium aspiration is getting that meconium deep down into the lungs, which kind of acts like glue and doesn't allow those alveoli to open and the oxygen uh, exchange to happen. Our retinopathy of prematurity is a condition that is caused by the oxygen that we give to these babies and it stops the growth of the retina and they sometimes even have to have surgery to continue that blood supply and growth to the retina so that um, they don't have visual difficulties later. Peri intraventricular hemorrhage, PVH or IVH. I think most of this, um, so, so we see this, we call this an intracranial bleed. Our younger babies, our smaller for gestational age babies and our uh, younger gestational age babies will have an increased chance of interventricular hemorrhage. And this is the reason that we give um, moms magnesium sulfate for that neuroprotection at delivery. It is to try to avoid this uh, peri-intraventricular hemorrhage. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a condition that happens in the gut. And it is usually from lack of um, blood supply and part of that gut is not functioning and starts to die. And these babies are very sick and typically um, may need surgery to help correct that problem. We've discussed the issues with infants of diabetic mothers. We've discussed some of the birth trauma that can happen. We'll spend some more time talking about that in just a minute. We have newborns of substance abuse mothers. Uh, these babies have to withdraw from those medications. And sometimes this is a several week process for that to happen hyperbilirubinemia, we're gonna spend some time on that one, and newborn infections. So you can see there's a lot of things that can go wrong that are specific to our newborn period. Respiratory distress syndrome comes from uh, lung immaturity and that lack of alveolar surfactant. That's what keeps that, that alveoli open in order for that gas exchange to happen. So our nursing assessment would be the things that we've talked about when we're doing our normal newborn assessment. If you see nasal flaring, retractions, central cyanosis, uh, tachycardia, uh, or tachypnea, a fast heart rate or fast respiratory rate, we need to confirm that we don't have um, uh, respiratory distress syndrome. And they would do a chest x-ray and be looking for some specific findings in that chest x-ray. We may have to support them with some oxygen and or some pressure using CPAP to help these little guys keep those uh, lungs open. Here are a couple of different ways that we can support them. This is the traditional 
um, a ET tube that uh, you uh, ventilation, a mechanical ventilation that would happen for this baby. Here we have a CPAP, and every four hours we're going to move these prongs from nasal to a mask type because these little babies' faces are so fragile and so moldable that if we kept the same type on for the period of time that they might need it, it could actually change structure, cause structural changes in the baby's face and nose. So they will typically do evidence-based is to change these um, every four hours back and forth so that we don't cause permanent changes. And then this is a high flow nasal cannula. We do use um, tape that is specifically made for this purpose to help these babies. And remember their skin is so fragile that we have to be uh, very gentle when we are um, utilizing these tapes and glues. Birth trauma is typically related to the forces of labor and delivery and that baby coming down through that pelvis. Some of the things we might see are fractures, fractures of the humerus, fractures of the leg, uh, brachial plexus injury, cranial nerve trauma, head trauma, cephalohematomas, and caput. Caput we've discussed in previous lectures, that's that swelling that happens under the head, under the um, skin, and it crosses that suture line. Uh, hematomas do not cross that suture line. And if we see a hematoma forming, we need to be very uh, on the lookout for um, inter in increased intracranial pressure. Uh, we are always doing our nursing assessment looking for anything that is odd in the physical assessment, swelling, the inability of the baby to move their arms, symmetry, structure, function. Now the baby's head can look very misshapen when it's born, but remember that is uh, the ability of that baby to fit down through that pelvis by those uh, bones molding on top of each other, sliding over each other and uh, fitting through that head. That's normal and that should get better in just a couple of days. But we are watching to make sure that that cephalohematoma, which does not cross the suture lines and that's bleeding under the skull, is not getting increased. This is a brachial plexus injury. So when we're talking about shoulder dystocia, which we spent a lot of time on when we talked about um, difficult labor and birth, but this is, the, this is the nerve that actually becomes injured. So here we have this baby, the head is born, that shoulder is stuck. It's not able to fit through that pelvis. So this pelvis is cut away so you can see what's going on. And if the provider puts a lot of traction on this baby's head, trying to help that baby get down, we can actually cause an injury to this brachial plexus. And that brachial plexus is very fragile. If it becomes injured, it can actually be stretched to the point of no return. And if that happens, we have something called Herb's palsy, E-R-B-S palsy, and that's what has happened here. So you can see this man obviously had a brachial plexus injury, has had some surgery to try to fix it, and um, unfortunately, is, is probably has no use of this arm. That's why you see the muscle wasting happen here. This is a classic sign of a baby that has Herb's palsy. They're not able to move that arm around right after delivery. So if you've had a shoulder dystocia, this is one of the assessments that we're going to be performing on the newborn. We're going to be looking for that moro or startle reflex, and we're going to look to see if that baby naturally is able to lift their arm or not. The pediatrician would need to be notified if this baby is not able to move their arm and, of course, be giving a S-bar report about the difficult delivery. And sometimes they will put these babies in a sling. They'll do some x-rays to make sure that we don't have a broken humerus. And occasionally, that nerve is just stretched and swollen and can recover. But if it's been too great, they um, are not able to recover that unfortunately, and it becomes a permanent injury. So we don't want any of our babies to be injured, and that's not ever our goal, but some of the maneuvers that we do, we need to be very careful so that we're not encouraging this in injury to happen. So McRoberts pulling the mom's legs back and doing that, that suprapubic pressure, those are two of the maneuvers that have been determined to help give us more room and help this baby come out without applying additional pressure on this baby's neck and potentially causing that brachial plexus injury. So that's Herb's palsy that results from that injury. If the 
baby has had trauma during delivery, we need to, of course, be supportive to that family. Um, an open, honest dialogue is the, the best course of action. Of course, you're going to follow whatever policy and procedure your facility has come up with, and the, the provider should be having this conversation with them. Um, looking for uh, a resolution uh, or um, tools that can help recovery for any of those birth trauma incidences, looking at a realistic appraisal of the situation, and then ongoing referral. These would be our roles. And again, the provider is going to have, um, hopefully, a good conversation with the family and do a debrief and talk about why they think that this injury might have occurred and what our next steps are from, from this point forward. I'm going to spend just a minute talking about hyperbilirubinemia. I know I've discussed this in other lectures, but I want to spend just a minute talking about it here. Our babies are born with immature livers. If you have a premature baby or a small for gestational age baby, they have even a greater immature liver. And so we do see physiologic jaundice. That is a common event for many babies. 30 to 40% of our babies have some um, version of physiologic jaundice. And that peaks about the third or fourth day of life and then proceeds to get better. Sometimes we will call our um, babies that are breastfeeding, our, our solely breastfed babies, we call it not enough breast milk jaundice because the volume is not there it, it, present in the breast to get the babies feeding enough to start excreting that excess bilirubin. They excrete it through their stools. So we Sometimes we'll see not enough breast milk jaundice. And in that case, um, we can encourage mom to hand express and give spoon feed or cup feed, anything that, the, that she gets out of there. Lots of skin to skin time, um, encouraging feedings, especially if that baby is sleepy. There are some facilities that have donor breast milk that we could use as a supplement. And if none of that is working and the baby continues to rise and we're starting to worry that we're getting into that high risk zone, we might even consider a supplement with formula because we want to make sure that this baby doesn't get into that high risk zone. If we have babies that are not being watched very closely, those late pretermers that sometimes can be poor feeders, they go home, mom's not really... Um, astute enough to see that the, the um, baby's not feeding well or maybe didn't have good education before she went home, we might want to think about supplements for those little guys as well. And our late onset breastfeeding jaundice is something that happens weeks down the road. This is not something that happens at birth. So sometimes you will see pediatricians say, we just need to give formula and that will break the cycle. And what they're referring to is a late onset breastfeeding jaundice. And again, this is not going to happen at birth. And um, it's unfortunate that sometimes our pediatricians are confusing those two. Pathological jaundice, on the other hand, is jaundice that occurs within the first 24 hours of life. These babies are at higher risk for having conicteris, which is the damage to the brain from the jaundice levels that have gotten too high. Uh, we see this with ABO incompatibilities, our blood incompatibility between mom, baby, and, and dad, and our RH um, negative moms, moms that have been built up antibodies to um, RH positive babies. So pathological jaundice happens within the first 24 hours of life and needs to be treated aggressively. These babies need to be fed. They need to be supplemented. Sometimes they will go straight to the NICU and have IV fluid and um, billy lights. And that's one of the tools that we will use to help these babies break down that billy room and is billy lights. And I'll discuss that in the next few slides. So we're always looking at risk factors. When we're doing our nursing assessment, what is our risk factor? Is our baby premature? Did our mom have um, diabetes. Did we use oxytocin during our, our delivery process? Our, our, what is our jaundice risk category? Where are we in relationship to the hours old versus how high that jaundice level is? I'm going to show you that in the next screen. Do we have signs of RH incompatibility? Did this baby um, have signs of being, uh, of having large amounts of red blood cell breakdown? by being anemic uh, and what are the bilirubin levels. So that is our role as a nurse is we're constantly assessing. And then we're going to be looking at how well is the baby feeding? Do we have good output? 
do we have babies that are adequately at the breast, emptying the breast, getting everything that they need? Um, is, is mom comfortable with the feeding plan? And then we're going to look at things like phototherapy and some of the other tools that we can use if these babies do um, have a bilirubin level that is getting into that high risk zone. We also want to provide good education and support to these moms and families as they go home, signs and symptoms to report, and where they're going to go if they see these signs and symptoms. So these are just some examples of some of the Billy lights that we have. These lights are, um, they enable, this is a Billy blanket, and, and this is a Billy blanket. And sometimes this therapy is even done at home. We try to keep these families together as much as possible. But what this light does is it allows the Billy ribbon to be turned into a water soluble substance so it can be excreted through the urine as well as the stool. So it doubles the capacity of the baby able to break, being able to break down that Billy ribbon. If we are using overhead lights, we also need to have some eye protection on these babies. We don't want them to have their um, eyes exposed to those lights for long periods of time. Here are risk factors. And if you look down here, this is a nice little mnemonic. It spells the word jaundice. So if it's visible in the first day of life, again, that's pathological. If they've had a sibling with neonatal jaundice or anemia, they um, are at, going to be at higher risk. If we have unrecognized hemolysis, so ABO incompatibility, RH incompatibility, some of these other genetic uh, diseases that increase your uh, breakdown of red blood cells, non-optimal feeding, deficiency of G6PD. That's one of the things that we're looking for in our newborn screen, and we won't know that for several uh, weeks, but uh, for a couple of weeks, if the baby, if they had some genetic testing prenatally, they may already know that this baby has a deficiency. Infection, infant of a diabetic mother or immaturity, so being premature. If they had excessive bruising or a cephalohematoma, or if their hematocrit is high, which we typically will see in our infants of diabetic mothers, then over 65% then they are at higher risk because they have more red blood cells that need to be broken down. And if they are East Asian, Mediterranean, or Native American heritage, they have higher levels of bilirubin. Here is the chart that I've been referring to. So when we are looking at this risk zone, we're going to plot the hours of the baby, the age in hours, and then we're also going to look at their level. So we only, we need to know both these pieces of information in order to be able to plot um, what risk zone we're in. So if I have a baby that is 24 hours old and is, has a transcutaneous, which you can uh, test through the skin, it's non-invasive, a transcutaneous billy of seven, I'm here in that low intermediate risk zone and I am normal. But if I have a baby that's six hours old and that billy is seven, you can see that I am in that high risk zone. So it is dependent on the hours of age. And so we want to catch babies in this area. We never want them to get to this area. If we're here in the critical risk zone, we are in that um, level of potential uh, conicterous formation. So that, that is very concerning. So this is how we're plotting them. And we have different nursing interventions for each risk zone. Obviously in the low risk zone, we just give good education. Before the parents go home, low intermediate, we're gonna follow up in three to five days. High intermediate, they're gonna be seen within 24 hours and make sure that they have a good feeding plan and very good education about what to happen if they um, see the signs and symptoms that need to be reported. High risk zone, those babies are gonna stay with us and we're going to continue checking their bilirubins until we see it start to trend down. Uh, this is called the bilirubin nomograph, by the way. And then we have infections. We have lots of different times that babies can become infected. It can be um, intrauterine. That can happen from prolonged rupture of membranes. It can happen, um, we can encourage the intrauterine infections by moms that uh, are having lots of vaginal exams. We, so that's one of the reasons that we try to limit the amount of vaginal exams. Other, uh, uh, if mom has an infection somewhere else, there's a chance of moving into an intrauterine infection. We have that early onset, which is the 
perinatal period, and then we have late onset, which is the first week of life. So we can have bacterial, fungal, viral, all sorts of uh, microorganisms that can get into their blood or other tissues. And so our signs and symptoms of this would be, they're nonspecific, but decreased temp. In our newborns, we typically will have a decreased temperature rather than an increased temperature because they just don't have the metabolic capacity to create heat. They might have poor feeding. We're going to be looking at things like a CBC with a manual differential. We want to catch these babies early on when they're first starting to show signs. So if they have a large left shift or uh, lots of um, uh, baby neutrophils being produced, which are the baby white blood cells that are, that are trying to mount that army in reaction to that infection um, or lots of bands, we will be concerned that this baby is starting to brew an infection. And again, we cannot wait until they have specific signs because these babies do not have the capacity to fight that off. And we may or may not be able to help them if we wait too long. We also look for things like um, in certain facilities, they're still using the C-reactive protein, a CRP. And that's a nonspecific test that's looking for signs of inflammation, signs of infection, and a positive blood culture. Now that takes 24 to 48 hours to come back. So if we suspect that there is infection, we will treat aggressively. And if it comes back negative, um, then we know that we don't have overwhelming sepsis. And uh, depending on the provider, they will either continue their five, seven, or 10 day course of antibiotics. Some of the risk factors for neonatal sepsis, maternal risk factors, poor prenatal care, poor nutrition, substance abuse, low socioeconomic status. In interpartum, again, that premature rupture of membranes. If mom has a fever, that's a sign there's a potential infection. We need to be looking at that. Um, typically, uh, chorioamnitis, which is the infection of the lining uh, of the sac. Prolonged labor increases the chance. Prolonged rupture of membranes, more than 12 to 18 hours. Premature labor and mater maternal urinary tract infection. So any of these things increase our chance for having uh, uh, infection in our newborn. So we need to put that in our SBAR report and make sure we're passing that along to whoever's going to be caring for that baby after us. Uh, nursing management of our infections, antibiotic therapy, we're going to support their circulatory, respiratory, nutritional, and development system, just like we would if they didn't have an infection. Uh, again, education, talking about these babies uh, and their fragile immune systems to their parents, giving them good education. This is why they're so specific in the NICU about the things that can come into the environment, how we have to wash our hands, not wearing jewelry, making sure that anyone that has any signs of illness is not coming to work that day and no visitors with any signs of illness. We just cannot risk it with our fragile newborns. And once these babies go home, their immune systems, as I've mentioned before, are just not up to par with their counterparts that were born at their gestational age. So not allowing, not going into um, populated areas, not taking them to the mall, not taking them to areas where they're going to be exposed, especially during flu season. This little sign I thought was a great idea. This is on a car seat. And um, these little outfits, these are superhero outfits that were uh, provided to this NICU and they took pictures for the parents. NICU nurses are fiercely protective of their babies and that's because they're taking care of the most fragile um, popu uh, patient population that we have. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, you know where to reach me.